Today I would like I would like to emphasize the role of sovereignty of the nation state in maintaining the freedom of nations. The struggle of the enslaved nations of Central Europe was at its heart a struggle for national sovereignty. This matter united all patriots across the political spectrum because we believed that our rights and liberties could only be safeguarded within the context of regained sovereign states. In Europe, nothing will safeguard the freedom of nations, their culture, their social and economic, political and military security better than nation states. Other systems are illusory or utopian. They can be strengthened by intergovernmental and even partially supranational organizations such as the European Union, but nation states in Europe cannot be replaced. Europe was born much earlier than the American Republic, whose unity was also forged through civil war. That is why it is so misleading to refer to this historical analogy. Any political system that falls to respect the sovereignty of others, democracy, or the elementary will of the nations will sooner or later lead to utopia or tyranny. It was Christian Europe that gave birth to a civilization which respected human dignity more than any other. That civilization is worth protecting, especially when faced with hard-hearted and increasingly strong civilizations for which democratic and liberal values do not matter. We want to build a strong Europe to meet the global challenges of the 21st century. It is also the scale of the European Union that makes it a significant force in the world, not its increasingly incomprehensible decision-making system. We need a Europe which is strong because of its nation states, not one built on their ruins. Such a Europe will never have any force because the political, economic and cultural power of Europe derives from the vital energy provided by nation states. The alternatives are either a technocratic utopia, which some in Brussels seem to envision, or a neo-imperialism which has already been discredited by modern history. The struggle of European nations for freedom did not end in 1989. This is best seen on our eastern border. What are Ukrainians really fighting for today? For what are they willing to risk their lives? Why did they not immediately surrender to the world's second strongest army? The struggle of Ukrainians for the right to national self-determination is yet another heroic manifestation of the defense of the nation-state and freedom. But in order to have the will to fight, one must really believe in what one is fighting for. Today, Ukrainians are fighting not only for their own freedom. Since February 24th, 2022, they have also been fighting daily for the freedom of all Europe. And it is also our future that dep depends on how this war unfolds. The defeat of Ukraine would be the defeat of the West, indeed of the entire free world. A defeat greater than Vietnam. After such a, de a defeat, Russia would strike again with impunity and the world as we know it would dramatically change. A long series of dangerous unknowns would follow. The defeat of the free world would likely embolden Putin just as the appeasement of the 1930s emboldened Hitler. Putin, like Hitler at the time, also enjoys huge public support, unfortunately. So we are facing the threat of escalation. The way to avoid this outcome is to stop feeding the beast. History is unfolding before our eyes. When our children read their textbooks, 
they will ask, did we do enough to ensure that a peaceful future for them? Did we think about them and the long-term good of our countries or only about short-term comf comfort and the postponing of difficult decisions for later? Have we learned from the mistakes of the past or will we keep, re keep repeating them? Until just before February 24, I had heard that Putin would not attack Ukraine. Many politicians in Europe preferred to believe this hoping it would be possible to continue Wandel durch Handel with Russia at the expense of Central Europe. In this context, let us return to the question, what are Ukrainians fighting for? Were they focused solely on material goods and not united by the sense of community, they would have given up long ago. This is what Putin was counting on. He believed that Ukrainians would choose peace at any price over freedom. But he was wrong. Why? What was the Kremlin's mistake? Putin is not a madman, as many of those who have been doing business with him for 20 years would have us believe. Putin was blinded by his own vision of the world. He was unable to see that Ukrainians are a nation and now they finally have their own nation state though it may be far from perfect they are willing to sacrifice their lives for it russian propaganda claims that there is no such thing as a separate ukrainian nation we all know the saying if the facts don't fit the theory change the facts that is why Russia is trying to explain to Ukrainians by force that they have no right to a national ident identity. Let us remember, a nation is a community of the living, the dead and those yet to be born. Today, Europe is witnessing crimes committed in the name of, anti of an anti-national ideology. That is what motivates Putin, the desire to eliminate all differences, destroy all national identities, and melt them into the great Russian Empire, into Ruski Mir. Russian propaganda has repeatedly made the false accusation of Ukrainian fascism. This is exactly what Stalin said. Call your opponents fascists, or anti-Semites, you just have to repeat those epithets often enough." End of quote. It must be said clearly, a fascist is someone who wants to destroy other nations. It is someone who violates human rights and tramples on human dignity. The fascist today is Vladimir Putin and all accomplices of Russian aggression. As Europeans, we have a duty to oppose Russian fascism. This is what European identity is all about. There should be no place in Europe for censorship or ideological indoctrination. We have already gone through this in the past when the communist authorities told us what to think. This was also experienced by Germans in the times of Hitler when the books were burned. Europe should be a, ca a cathedral of good and a university of truth. Europe should be a cathedral of good and a university of, good, of truth. Here too, it is worth highlighting that various bans, arbitrary decisions on what can and cannot be presented within the walls of universities, as well as political correctness, undermine the eternal mission of the academy the search for truth. And just as we protect our material heritage, we should also protect our spiritual heritage, which, which consists of citizens of different cultures and linguistic tradition, tradition. Europe's strength over the centuries has been its diversity. We share common values, but each na nation has its own identity. Gleichschalten Uravniwovka is a road to nowhere. 
In a deeper sense, the dispute today is between the sovereignty of states and the sovereignty of institutions. Between the democratic power of the people at a grassroots level and the top-down imposition of power by a narrow elite. In the 2,000 years of Europe's existence, no one has ever succeeded in political subordinating our entire continent. It will not work today either. The vision of a centralized Europe will end in the exact same place as the concept of end of history announced 30 years ago. The sooner we move away from this vision and accept democracy as the source of legitimate power in Europe, the better our future will be. By the way, there is no end of history. History is accelerating and bring, bringing challenges of unlimited proportions. Unfortunately, a large part of today's EU elite operates in an alternative reality. If EU elites stubbornly insist on the vision of a centralized superstate, they will face the resistance of more European nations. The more they persist, the fierce, fiercer the rebellion will be. And I do not want polarization, division and chaos. I want a strong and competitive Europe. So finally, allow me to summarize the four major matters that have been the focus of my address. Firstly, we cannot build our future without learning from our past. History shows that a politics that does not respect sovereignty and the will of the people will sooner or later dissolve into utopia or dictatorship. Europe has a bright future if it respects the diversity of its nations. Secondly, the future of Europe is being forged by Ukraine's fight for freedom on our behalf. It is our duty to support Ukraine. The Ukrainian fight spirit should be an inspiration and guide for our actions. Thirdly, a democratic community of nations based on an ancient Greek, Roman and Christian heritage one which fosters peace, freedom and solidarity is the bedrock of European values. These values have formed the basis of European integration and they can continue to be the continent's driving force. What threatens to undercut these forces is centralization. The rule of the strongest and the arbitrary entrustment of Europe's future to a heartless bureaucracy that is trying to reset values. Such a reset that is bureaucratic centralization under the guise of federalization is the seed for great future conflicts and social rebellions. And fourthly, if Europe is to win the race for global leadership, it must transform. It must be ready to accept new countries, but also in the face of a larger community to limit some of its competences. In the face of external threats, it must strengthen its defensive capabilities. Europe must maintain wise alliances, but it must also foster independence and not become the victim of energy or any economic blackmail. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe was once the center of the world, respected on every continent. Do we still care if Europe and our civilization survive? And not only if they survive, but in what form? Do we have the drive to be a leader? Or perhaps have we already come to terms with taking a backseat? Do we have the courage to make Europe great again? to make Europe victorious? I believe so. Europe has great potential. It stems from its history and heritage, but continues today in its innumerable qualities and advantages. What Europe needs, however, is determination and courage. And I am deeply convinced that if we work hard 
on behalf of our respective homelands and the continent as a whole, Europe will prevail. Europe will be victorious. Thank you very much.